Hey, Rent to Retires, it's Adam Schrader here today. Zach could not join me at the moment, but we are pleased to be joined by Michael Albaum. He is the host of the Remote Real Estate Investor Podcast. Michael, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Adam. Super excited to be here. Absolutely. Well, it's a pleasure to have you. So will you take us through a little bit about your real estate journey? How did you get started? Um, why is it the Remote Real Estate Investor Podcast? Um, and just kind of give us a brief rundown of uh, who you are. Yeah, absolutely. So I am a California native and did everything by the book, went to school, went to college, tried to go get a good job. And about that time, Fell, found this book, Rich Dad Poor Dad, which I'm sure a lot of your listeners have come across <laughs> as well. And it just frustrated the hell out of me because it changed everything I thought I knew about money. It kind of said, nah, you're not quite right. So I thought that I was going to get this great engineering job and that was going to get me where I wanted to go fast enough. And as soon as I saw the taxes come out of my paycheck, I was like, whoa, maybe <laughs> not as awesome of a job as I thought. So this is the rat race. <laughs> this is the rat race. Yeah. I was like, oh my God, I'm in the matrix. So <laughs> I uh, decided that I should be investing in rental property from the book and just spent about two years getting self-educated, trying to figure out how to do that. And decided that if I could do one property per year for 10 years, in 10 years, I'd have 10 properties. And for no good reason other than that sounded like a nice round number, that was my goal. And so I just started doing this in a market that I was um, fairly familiar with in Southern California. That was a couple hours away from where I grew up because we knew how to property manager down there. We knew an agent down there. And so it just kind of made sense. And I bit off way more than I could chew. I ran my models. I was working in my spreadsheets and I said, okay, I can afford this much house. Well, all the houses down there were a lot more than that. So <laughs> I said, okay, I'm uncomfortable, but I'll go ahead and do it anyhow. So took down a first property. Um, and when I finally got a tenant in place, I was like, I'm a genius. I figured this all out. I'm, I've reinvented the wheel. Needless to say, you know, I wasn't the first person to ever do that sort of thing. So fast forward a couple of years, I'm working as an engineer in the fire protection industry for a commercial property insurer. And I was traveling all over the country for work. And because I was now a property and rental property investor, I was always looking at the markets of where I happened to be for work. And so I would schedule myself such that I had a lot of free time. Thanks uh, a lot for my old manager, Dave. Hope you're not listening. And I was just picking up properties, like literally wherever I went that made sense from a rent to price ratio, because that was the only numbers I knew to look at. I was so green uh, to know any different, but those are the numbers I was looking at. And I found that a lot of these places I was for work just made sense. So I was buying up these properties all over the place. And it just got to a point where it was too much of a headache trying to chase all these different property managers in six different markets. So a buddy of mine, he's like, Michael, you're doing it all wrong. Go focus on like one or two markets and hammer them hard and watch what happens. It'll blow your mind. I was like, all right, that's kind of counterintuitive to everything I thought I knew about investing. But again, the rich dad, poor dad did the same thing to me. So I said, well, I'll give it a go. So I've been hitting this, the two markets that I've really been focusing on the last couple of years out in the Midwest is Cincinnati, Ohio and Covington, Kentucky. I've just been going hard in those markets for the last several years, and it truly has blown my mind. And so that's kind of where the remote piece of all this comes into play is I've been remote investing since day one. That's the only kind of investing I've known how to do. And so that's really what I teach now at the Rootstock Academy. And that's why we named the podcast Remote Real Estate Investor. We want to help folks get more involved with investing remotely, not only where they live. Yeah, absolutely. And so had, do you still have that California one or did you uh, learn, from your, learn from your investing and sell it? Yeah, so it's funny. I'm actually in the process of selling it. Um, I'm going to 1031 it out into a short-term rental out in the Smoky Mountains. So it's just about doubled in value since I bought it. Yeah, I'm glad you haven't had any uh, serious tenant issues. And had somebody always tell people whenever I talked to them, I said, you know, we like landlord-friendly states, so we don't co-own our properties with our tenants because it can. Uh... <laughs> well, it's it's funny you mention that, and it's something I've talked about on a couple episodes of the Remote Real Estate Investor. That actually, that property had the worst tenants I've ever had in my entire life. Um, long story short, they did about ten thousand dollars in damage, smeared human feces on the way out of the property, and I had to go to small claims court. I mean, it was just like awful, and it was my first property. And so people are asking me like, "What? Like, what were you thinking? How dumb were you to keep investing?" I, like, I didn't know any different. I just thought that's okay, kind of what property investing is. And if you can make it through that, the other side will be a little bit better. And I'm really glad I didn't stop at at that just that one. Yeah, absolutely. So you said you know when you first started, you just looked at rent to purchase price. 
you know, and you were, that's how green you were. So what are some of the metrics that you really like to look at now whenever you're in your markets and deciding, you know, what property to, to go after? Yeah, it's a super good question. So I tend to gravitate towards like four or five different metrics. And so one is I want to see population growth in the market that people are actually moving to the area. Two, I want to see job growth so that people that are moving there have jobs to work. Third, I want to see wage or salary growth. And then fourth, I want to see diversification of employment. So anyone who could have looked at Detroit could have seen the writing on the wall, single sector economy for the most part, as soon as auto manufacturing dried up went overseas, that was a big problem for that town. And so if you have a bunch of legs supporting the chair that is the economy, so to speak, if there's a bunch of different legs propping it up, you lose one or two, it's not the end of the world. Yeah. And you know the, the last thing I like to look for, Adam, is just to see a, the, um, like a bunch of deals that I would be interested in purchasing. Because now that I'm kind of clustering properties and really hammering one or two markets, I don't want to just go buy the one good deal in that particular market and then get priced out. So I'm looking for repeatability too. Yeah. So when it comes to the individual properties though, which, uh, which metrics do you like to look at? So I'm a huge fan of cash on cash return. So I'm looking at cap rate and cash on cash return because I want to make sure that I'm purchasing at an appropriate cap rate independent of what kind of leverage I'm using because if, when I do go to ultimately sell the property, I want to make sure that there is some room. I've given myself some room. And so I was a value add multifamily investor for years. And so that was really a great space to be in because you could buy at high caps, sell it low, and now you've created a big spread for yourself. Yeah. Now, why, I mean, cap rate for single families I found is a little, not quite as helpful. I mean, it depends on how you're buying. So are you buying distressed and kind of fixing it up or are you buying like the turnkey model or kind of, because cap rate when it comes to like turnkey isn't quite as useful because you can't really do the value add that really kind of pumps it up. So what kind of properties are you buying? So today I'm, it's my strategy is, is shifted since the last couple of years, but I was really focused on multifamily, commercial multifamily. So right. five units and up value add, heavy value add. And I've taken on a couple of projects that were too heavy, a little, you know, a little <laughs> bit out of my pay grade value add stuff that I was pretty over eager. Uh, so learned, learned some lessons there, but ended up doing okay. Um, so that's really where I was focusing the last couple of years, but now I'm transitioning a little bit more to short-term rentals and uh, and getting getting more niche in that space. Yeah, now it, you know the Smoky Mountains is I'm assuming is the short-term rental side. That, um, are you going to kind of branch out into a third or fourth market? Because I would assume that Cleveland probably isn't the uh, or was it Cincinnati? Cincinnati, yeah. Yeah, Cincinnati. I imagine it isn't the greatest short-term rental market. Yes. So it's funny, actually. So we're branching out into uh, the Smoky Mountains. Yes. And also looking to do a little bit more closer to home. So I've really kind of come full circle on the remote piece. So my wife and I are actually house hacking right now. So we bought a basic duplex uh, where we're living as our primary and so renting out the upstairs. And we would love to do more of that as we as we transition into our next primary, whenever that might be doing the same thing and now renting out the existing duplex with full term tenants. Yeah. So you say you like to look at cash on cash, which I love that metric as well. Obviously, with today's market, with escalating prices and increasing interest rates, cash on cash has been severely squeezed yes. uh, for people because you're seeing your cash flow just get lower and lower and lower. And so year one, you kind of, in my opinion, almost have to write it off at this point and say, it's going to be low. I have to look at you know my rental increases. So kind of how, what is your perspective on the current market that we're in when it comes to cash on cash? <laughs> that's a really good question. I think that people really need to adjust their expectations. And, and that's myself included. You know, we talk about a couple of years ago, double digit cash on cash returns <laughs> for your kind of run of the mill property. That just doesn't really exist anymore, kind of from an off the shelf perspective. Now you can create those types of properties fairly easily, I would wager. And so I think we just have to look at things through a little bit of a different lens. And just because a property has been sitting for a while doesn't necessarily mean that it's a bad property or just because the property needs a bit of a facelift doesn't mean that it's a bad property. But I think the days of being able to buy, you know, turnkey or off the shelf and get double digit cash on cash returns, it's going to just be really tough. Yeah, I was actually talking with a friend of mine who's an investor like myself the other day. It's only a day or two ago, I think. And we were talking about kind of our real estate journey and how, you know, when we started buying, you could buy a turnkey and get, 
you know, 15, 16% cash on cash. And yeah, you know, that wasn't a big deal, but now, you know, it's almost, but build to rent wasn't really a thing back then. You know, this was you know, several years ago and now build to rent is becoming a bigger thing and you can get good, good returns there or, you know, get in better neighborhoods than you could originally. And so, you know, I like what you're talking about adjusting your expectations. You know, you have to kind of adjust to what the market's giving you as well, because I mean, it's, you know, the, these, these things, like you were saying, you, you can't really get 15, 16% cash on cash for a turnkey property, but you can buy newer where you couldn't, you know, 15 or even five years ago um, in that market. So I right. like, uh, <laughs> I like your adjusting expectations. So, yeah. Um, and I mean, the other thing I'll say too, Adam is, is cash on cash is such a big metric for me, but I think when it comes to deciding to go or no go, looking at your total return is likely to be more impactful too. And what I mean by total return is we have to look at the cash flow. Yes. But we should also look at the appreciation, the loan pay down, and then the tax benefits. You clump all those things together and your six to 7% cash on cash return that you might be seeing today tends to get a little bit easier to digest when you factor <laughs> in all those things. So, and that's, I think a problem that investors see is like, oh, I can get 10% in the stock market. Why would I bother with 6% in the real estate space? Like, well, it's not really 6%. There's a lot more to it than that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So what markets are you considering, you know, venturing? Are, well, short-term rentals, is that kind of your only focus right now? Or are you seeing kind of, are you still dabbling in the commercial? And what markets are you going to go into? Because I assume, I mean, we like people to be in three to five markets because, you know, just to diversify yourself across the country and yeah. get, you know, even more diversity. And that's not necessarily six, seven, eight. You know, that can start getting to be a bit much. I'm going in my fifth market, but I've been established. And I'm actually getting out of one market. So I guess I'll still be in four. But what markets are you seeing having good potential when it comes to, you know, investors going in and, and finding good quality properties? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. So I'm focusing on the Smoky Mountains for the next couple of properties. I have not been purchasing multifamily value add stuff uh, for the last couple of years just because it has been so overheated and then coupled with the cost of materials going through the roof. So I'm in the midst of a development project and actually had two fires in the building during the course oh, of construction. Geez. It was locked in like a two plus year insurance battle. Like it was such a nightmare. And so having watched the price of a two by four go from three bucks to four bucks to eight bucks to 11 bucks in the middle of this whole pandemic rehab process has just been a total nightmare. So I'm still licking my wounds from that, trying to get it over the finish line. So that's been my main focus in terms of value add for the multifamily space. So that's why I've been picking up these short-term rentals is it's just easier. It's less headspace, less mental capacity. Uh, and it's just a bit simpler. I can give it to a management company and say, go to town and start to generate some immediate cash flow. So I'm I'm continuing to focus on the markets that I'm in in Cincinnati and Kentucky, Northern Kentucky, and now in the Smoky Mountains. Nice. So what do you say to real estate investors who are kind of on the fence getting started? I mean, we talk to these people all day, every day, but what are your kind of big things that you give to real estate investors? I mean, I'm assuming you don't give everybody a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad, even though I feel like 99% <laughs> of, I think I'm one of the few real estate investors out there who read Rich Dad, Poor Dad after I started investing in real estate. After kind of, you drank the, the Kool-Aid? What? After you drank the Kool-Aid. Yeah. Oh, I actually awesome. read it and I was like, oh yeah, I, I, I'm doing this. So, I know okay. this. That makes sense. <laughs> so, well, that's great. so what do you tell, you know, real estate, uh, you know, the real novice real estate investors or the people kind of dragging their feet right now. So I have a clarifying question. Have, are they already on board with real estate investing or are they just trying they to- They know the idea. Decision? They like the idea of it, they like but the they idea. haven't taken the plunge. Okay. I think first and foremost, you have to get educated. And that was one thing that I thought I did uh, by kind of that self-education process, but clearly I had so much more to learn. But I think starting with education and figuring out what it is that you're even trying to accomplish. Because people hear real estate investing, it's this very sexy term. They hear about people making a lot of money with it, but that could mean very different things to very different people. And so I have people that come into the Roofstock Academy and they're like, yeah, I want to make a million bucks in real estate in the next two years. I'm like, awesome. Do you have 5 million to start with? Because <laughs> that's kind of what we're working with. And so it's that expectation setting and understanding, okay, what does real estate investing mean for you? What are you actually trying to accomplish? Is it reasonable? Is it feasible? 
because if it's not, you're just setting yourself up for failure. And then you're going to go say real estate investing sucks. It doesn't work. It's not for me. And that might be the case, but I think that there are enough of us doing it that <laughs> speaks to the contrary. So getting an understanding first and foremost about what it is they're trying to accomplish and then making sure that they have, they're equipping themselves with the tools to go be successful at it, knowing full well that they're going to make mistakes along the way. Yeah, absolutely. I love I love that. So when it comes to today's, I mean, a lot of people are getting scared by obviously inflation. They're getting scared by, you know, rising interest rates. What's your take on kind of what this means for the investors moving forward? Like, how do you assuage those concerns? And kind of where do you think we're headed when it comes to the overall market? Yeah. I mean, I'm I feeling lucky that I just changed the batteries in my crystal ball. So we're, we're all <laughs> up in charge. So I, you know, it's interesting because it's a very unique time seemingly in the market. Most financial logic would tell us that as interest rates go up, prices come down. But we have this kind of backstop, I feel like, with institutional capital that is not playing in the same field or even the same ballpark. <laughs> that the rest of us are playing at they're getting their interest rate is significantly lower than ours they have a lot of a lot more cash to be playing with and so i don't foresee this massive pullback in prices that a lot of people are thinking would normally happen when we have higher interest rates demand is still really pent up supply is still way under where it needs to be and will be for quite some time and so i just think when you mix all those things together you don't you don't get a resultant negative or pullback in terms of purchase price. So to that end, I think interest rates have to come down at some point. And so I think if you can get into properties and the fundamentals still make sense, go do it. And that's kind of the approach I've taken because we can sit and speculate all day what interest rates are going to do or what prices are going to do. But at the end of the day, if you're investing in real estate to generate cash flow, to generate a return as a hedge against inflation, and you're still able to do those things, maybe not as attractive as it was a year ago, two years ago, three years ago, but in something that meets your buy box or gives you an acceptable return, then I don't see any reason why you shouldn't be doing that. And at the end of the day, if rates come down, you get to refinance. And that's pretty killer. And if they don't and they continue to go up, well, yay, you, you locked in a better rate than you would have in a year from now. Yeah. And uh, for those listeners who haven't listened to the podcast that Zach and I did together, we're about higher rates and you know lower home prices. Uh, we actually went back. I don't, I don't know if you've done this, but we went back 30 years and looked at the six times that interest rates have really spiked. And we've actually found that in, I believe it was four of the six times, if you compared the previous 12 months home price escalation, it was as good, if not better during the time following those interest rate spikes. So like you were saying, the whole home prices come down just because interest rates go up. It's really home prices go up and interest rates go up because our economy is, you know, roaring and we're doing really well. And to your point, you know, I really love the fact right now that, you know, even if you get in at six, 7%, if you are cash flowing, that's six, 7% means that you're going to get your rents pushed up fairly significantly for probably the next, you know, two to three years. And then, you know, if you have that six or 7% interest rate, when interest rates go back down to, you know, fours or, you know, somewhere in the fours, you have a much better chance of refinancing, you know, pulling cash out if you want and lowering the rate and, you know, continuing to get an amazing cash flow because of the fact you have the higher rent. I think a lot of people who, you know, locked in their rate at, three, three and a half percent. That's fantastic for them right now. I'm curious to see what happens in the future whenever it comes to pulling equity out of those homes because HELOCs on investment properties are tough to get right now in the market. Yes. And are they going to be willing to do a cash out refinance and raise their interest rate, you know, a full percent? I'm I'm curious to see what happens uh, when the, when that situation arises. I don't know if you have any take on what you think people might do in that situation. Yeah, well, it's funny because I'm one of those people that locked in at 3% in the low threes. So it's a tough pill to swallow. I was just about to go through a refinance where I was giving up a three and a quarter rate on a commercial property to take a four and a quarter rate to lock in a 30 year fixed term and get some cash out. The lender ultimately ended up pulling the rug out from under me on the last last minute. And I'm still fuming about it, if I'm being honest, Adam. But <laughs> Uh, neither, neither here nor there, but I think it, it is an interesting point because you, I will be giving up a really attractive interest rate if I do ever want to pull equity out of those properties again. So finding different ways to extract the equity 
is is what I'm now focusing on because the rates have gone up. So in you know playing around with HELOCs or BLOCs, uh, home equity line of credits or business line of credits on properties, as opposed to changing the actual rate and term of the loan itself, uh, is an interesting strategy that I'm toying around with right now. Yeah. So what had happened to your goal? I mean, you said whenever you started, it was 10 properties in 10 years. What did you end up, has it been 10 years first off? And then how has your goal been met, exceeded or not met? Yeah. So it's been, um, it's been just about 10 years. Yes. And I blew through that goal fairly quickly. I'm happy to say. And so the goalpost just kept moving and moving and moving. And in, I think it was 2019, um, I hit 75 units between single family and multifamily. And my goal was a hundred. And I just got to a point where I was doing like three or four value add projects at once. I was actually traveling internationally with my wife. So I was in Costa Rica at the time. And I was like, man, this is just like a lot for one person. <laughs> and I, I was chatting with uh, a guy, Chad Carson. He's a bigger pockets contributor and a coach and just an excellent human being overall. And we've had him on our podcast a couple of times. And he wrote an article talking about doing less or doing more with less. And he says, everyone thinks you need this big portfolio. And he ran this analysis of, of three different kind of personas. And he showed a family that had seven rentals all paid off, was generating more than enough to live off of, as compared to the person with 100 units leveraged to the hilt, uh, is making you know maybe a little bit more in terms of cash flow, but just has a lot more headaches and a lot more moving parts. And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> and I realized that like my ego is not my amigo. And this thing to drive me to get to 100 units was just so I could say I had 100 units. And that really didn't make sense for me anymore. And if that's your goal, awesome. If, if that works for you, awesome. But that just wasn't working for me with the kind of lifestyle that I was planning for myself and my wife. And so I said, let's, I'm going to look to do more with less. And so I started selling off the properties that were causing headaches, buying properties that were easier to manage, easier to run, and were just more or less turnkey. Um, and so I've really kind of come full circle. And so now I'm sitting at about 55 units and looking to finish this development project, buy a couple more short-term rentals, and then just kind of park things for a while, to be honest. Yeah. So what are your, how do you, I, I don't love having equity in homes because, you know, then it's earning you 0% or in yeah. this case, you know, maybe even negative 8.5% right. uh, depending on what's happening there. So how do you get over that? And just knowing that, you have all this equity. I mean, if you have seven homes that are paid off, you know, you've got, you know, probably well over, I mean, if you're looking at single families, you've probably got, you know, million, million, million and a half change. or so locked up in these properties. How do you justify that to yourself to just leave a million dollars sitting in the, the properties? It's a really good question. And when I get to that point, I will be sure to let you know. But in <laughs> thinking about it, trying to be forward thinking about it, I think for me, I've just come to a point after having so much brain damage from doing value add stuff, banging my head against the wall, trying to get things to work, um, that if the outcome, meaning the cash flow that you're generating is supporting the lifestyle that you want, who cares? <laughs> and so if you're if you've achieved the thing that you're trying to achieve, doesn't really matter how much equity you have tied up in the property. And people can argue both sides of that, that that's a reckless thing to do because the equity could evaporate, evaporate tomorrow. Some people could say it's the safest way to own property. You know, I probably think having more equity is, is on the safer side. And this is coming from someone who is leveraged to the hilt because I was in growth mode for so many years. Um, paying off properties once you've hit your cash flow target, I think can make a lot of sense. And that's what I do plan to do once I once I do hit my cash flow goals. Yeah. I always like to tell people whenever you're going for your cash flow goals, you know, let's say it's ten thousand dollars a month. I like people to get up to twelve thousand dollars a month or thirteen. You know, if you think I need seven properties to retire, we'll get nine or ten because at some point you're gonna have a vacancy and you don't want to be sitting there with a credit card bill due where you're saying, oh crap. You know, I, I don't have the cash. I wish flow I had a little bit more this month. Yeah, right. give yourself a a little bit of a buffer there. So, but I I, I can understand the the equity situation there. Um, I, it's one of those things I'll have to get over in my mind as it uh, comes closer for for me as well. But whenever you talk to people who are interested in investing and maybe even started investing, and for you yourself, how did you? start your investment journey with a full-time job? Because I mean, 
especially doing value ads for crying out loud. Um, doing value ads with a full-time job is a heck of a venture to get yourself into, especially, you know, remotely, you know, regardless of whether it's a few hours away or, you know, multiple states, I doubt you're going to get off work at five or six and drive two to three hours to the home and do, you know, five hours of work and somehow get home and sleep and do work. So how did you do that process of starting to invest while still having your full-time job? Yeah. So I started very turnkey. Like I couldn't fathom putting more money into the property. And at the time I was so inexperienced, so green, I didn't know what value add was. I didn't realize it was a thing. I just thought people would buy turnkey properties and then get a tenant in place. And that was real estate investing. That was my kind of my, my purview. And as I just did that more and more, I learned, Hey, there's other ways to do this. And so my first two properties were very turnkey. The second one was like brand new construction. Um, and I was, because of the way my job was set up, I was a remote position. And so I was either in the field at client sites or working from home. And so because I had that flexibility from working from home, I was able to take calls, set up appointments, interview property managers, screen screen property managers, and, and folks who I was going to put on my team for my upcoming visit to that destination as I was traveling for work. So I really had an unfair advantage in, in those terms. <laughs> and it was funny. I was like, I was a senior engineer when I left the company and I was training newer engineers and I felt bad because they'd be over at my house and we'd be going over work stuff. I'm like, Oh, wait a minute. I gotta take this call. And then I'd go in the other room and talk like real estate. And I, this guy's like, what are you doing? I'm like, Oh, I do a little bit of investing on the side. Like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. So it, I would just leverage my time as best as I could. And when I got done doing engineering stuff at the end of the day, I would research investment properties and continue that self-education process. And so I think people have to make the time and uh, well, make the time to do what's important to them. And I think we do a really good job of that for our favorite TV shows or our favorite sporting <laughs> events or hanging out with friends. But oftentimes if it feels like work, we say, well, I'll do it tomorrow or I'll do it later. And that's why I think so many people never get started because it's so easy to make an excuse and it's so easy not to do it. Doing it is the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. And I want the last thing I want to touch on is property management. You know, you talked about having your one down in California and now, especially, you know, get vetting, vetting the short terminal one in the Smoky Mountains. What are the criteria you look for in property management companies whenever you're, you know, finding your, your initial one? I mean, you know, having two markets, I'm assuming, you know, you've been able to, you know, kind of focus down on that, but especially as you're moving into your new market, what do you look for in property management companies? One of the biggest things for me, Adam, is communication. If somebody can't communicate when we're in the kind of dating phase, when I'm figuring out if this is going to be a, a fruitful relationship, if this is going to work for me, there's no way it's going to work once we're, you know, quote unquote, married, once I've hired them and brought them on as a property manager. So I want communication to be top of mind. And then I want them to be effective. And so if someone can talk the talk, but they can't walk the walk, it's probably not going to be a great fit. And so the way that I figure out if they can walk the walk is usually by looking at the reviews online, which a lot of people will kind of scoff at because nobody takes the time to praise their property management company <laughs> as a tenant, right? It's only, oh, they ripped me off or they charged me for this, that, and the other thing. So take it with a grain of salt um, and then get references. Find out who else in the area is using the property managers. Find out. And, you know, it shouldn't be their cousin Earl that is their reference. It's someone who's an actual client that has actual units under management with them. Uh, and then I'm going to be very hands on at the beginning of the relationship until they've earned the trust and earned the right to manage my property with kind of me being more hands off. And it's an iterative process. Like I fired property managers before because it didn't work out. And I think it's really important that people feel comfortable and empowered to do that as opposed to just kicking the tire down the road and being like, oh man, this property manager sucks. It's not going well. <laughs> like do something about it. It's your business. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I, I'm the same way. I've fired property managers. I've hired new ones. I've tried self-managing. Didn't love that. I'm not going to do that again. But to me, um, you know, I've, I've told people this and I'll tell you, whenever I get that initial contract, you know, there's the maintenance reserve or maintenance reserve and how much they can spend of my money before right. they have to call me. Every single one I scratch out. Um, you know, they almost always say $500. I scratch it out. I write 200 and I have never had a property manager push back on the amount that they can spend of my money before they check in with me. I mean, it's there in the contract. So a lot of people think, oh, it's, you can't touch it every single time, scratch it out, sign it, send it back. They sign it. 
And so if they spend more than two hundred dollars, I'm like, hey, you guys are Look spending at the contract. more money than you're supposed to. <laughs> yeah, you gotta you gotta come talk to me before you do this. And so I love it. I also love the fact you, know, you talk about firing them sooner rather than later. I mean, I dragged my feet for eight or nine months before I fired one of my property managers that, you know, it ended up costing me money because, you know, they were doing, you know, doing things and repairs that probably didn't need to be done. They weren't communicating with me. You know, I was asking for things that I just didn't get. And, you know, it's very, it's very much a personal relationship with them. Like you can have somebody who loves their, their property manager, you use them, you get a different rep and you know, it's horrible. Different experience. Yep. Yeah. And whenever you do go online and read the reviews, I, I agree with you. Nobody takes very few people take the time to write good reviews, but you also want to go through it and look for the reviews written by owners <laughs> as yes. well, because there's a lot of them written by tenants who are like, oh, they were treating me so horribly. And then you find out, you know, oh, it's because they were, you know, they didn't pay their rent or yeah, whatever. They didn't pay their rent. I had this, <laughs> you'll love this story. I had a tenant file a fair housing complaint against me they went to the property management company saying that it was because i think it was because of race they said and then i found out i said you know why were they rejected well they were late on rent in their previous um their previous home 23 out of the last 24 months (laughs) (laughs) it's like like, yeah (laughs) how are you expecting to to get approved in this situation so i love the fact that i was able to just hand that off to the management company and i said you you guys deal with this i'm I'm not getting involved. That's what I pay but, you for. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So uh, before we wrap it up, are there any final thoughts you want to throw out to our listeners uh, about about your journey or about what you think they can do in their journey? Yeah, I think just for those who are thinking about getting started or, or wanting to get started, like you just that's something you have to do. You can read all of the books you want. You can listen to all the podcasts you want. You can take all the courses you want, but like, actually there's no substitute for actually doing it. I learned so much more in the first deal that I did than I could have ever from reading a book or a podcast. And I was one of the people that was like, one more book, one more podcast, like one, (laughs) like one more, and then I'll, and then I'll be ready. Um, and you just kind of have to rip that bandit off and, and jump in. And I came to the investment space from the insurance world, like I was sharing at the beginning. And so when I really took a step back, because I told you I was so scared and I was so overpriced in that very first property I bought, I was like, holy crap. When I took a step back and just understood what that meant from a monthly basis for me, what is my monthly obligation in terms of debts that I have to pay for the insurance taxes, mortgage? It just wasn't as scary. The whole number is huge. Yes. (laughs) <laughs> but when you take a step back and look and and figure out, okay, well, I'm earning this much at my job or from other income sources, and this is my number X, and I only have to pay Y, and that's if I don't have a tenant in place, that's the worst case scenario. Once you can square the two and feel good about it, then it's time to, to move on that feeling. And I think that that's what a lot of people have a really difficult time doing is they're only looking at the elephant, not at the size of the chunk that they need to bite off. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us. Michael is the host of the Remote Real Estate Investor Podcast. You can find that on any of your uh, podcast platforms out there. You can also uh, leave him a review uh, for his podcast. You know, I'm hoping that people aren't leaving, you know, bad reviews for you. I'm assuming I'm hoping that people who love you are leaving reviews uh, as yes. opposed to our property management companies out there. <laughs> but uh, right. I'm sure he'd appreciate a listen and a review from y'all. Uh, also, head to your podcast platforms and leave us a review. We really appreciate you doing that. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email us podcast at rent to retirement.com. That's podcast at rent to retirement.com. Really appreciate you taking the time to listen to this episode. We'll see you on the next one. Thanks for watching the Rent to Retirement YouTube channel. Check out some of our other videos, like this one or this one here.